So uh, thank you for coming out tonight to uh, learn all about the exciting topic of coal ash. Uh, appreciate you all coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Senator Scott Surveld. Uh, I represent the 36th Senate District, which you're currently sitting in. Uh, I'm also here with Delegate Luke Torian, who's uh, also here and you're in his district as well, 52nd Delegate seat. And uh, Delegate Jennifer Carroll Foy is on the way. She warned us that she's going to be uh, a little bit late because of traffic, but she'll be here as well. And I also want to one other former elected official to recognize Hilda Barber. It's Hilda. Hilda. Former uh, Potomac District Supervisor, longtime Potomac D or Woodbridge District, District Supervisor. Woodbridge. Yeah, who's, uh, who's here tonight as well, who's now in Potomac District. Uh, but I'm going to turn it over to what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to let Dominion go ahead and give their presentation. Uh, then I'm going to say a few words after that, sort of where I am on, on this issue. I think that uh, Delegate Carol Foy, when she gets here, she might have a few things to say. And then after that, we'll open it up to questions. So keep track of your questions. And uh, right now, I'm going to turn it over to Dominion. And uh, who's going to go? Jason, can you speak? Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Dominion to explain to you the report they just came out with, which was uh, present the report they issued which was due to the legislation that me and Luke and Jennifer passed uh, last session. Is a report the legislature required them to give, provides some better information about whether or not coal ash can be recycled. And I'm going to turn it over to them. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Everybody hear me okay? Being loud enough? Yes. All right, just do this number if I'm not speaking loud enough. So again, thank you for your time. Appreciate the opportunity to come and, and talk with you and share some information about uh, the process we've been through. Um, I think most people in the room know Possum Point. Uh, but this is a station located at the end of Possum Point Road. Uh, you'll recognize the Possum Point shape here. And the ponds are often in this area along the road before you get there. Just a little bit of information about um, Possum Point, the, the station itself. Then I'll talk about the statewide recycling plan that was completed. And then talk about well, what were the specific results for Possum Point. So Possum Point Power Station has been in operation since 1948. Um, it's got about 60 full-time employees, and it makes about 1,500 megawatts of power. So that's for units three, four, five, and six. And of those units, uh, three, four, and six are natural gas, and unit five uses a heavy oil. Uh, unit five doesn't run very much. Um, unit six runs pretty steady. And just a couple things that have, have changed at the stations over the years is the original two units from 1948 were retired in 2002. Those were coal units. And then a year later, we converted units three and four to natural gas. So there hasn't been any coal burned at the station since 2003. One other thing that I'll just add, just so everybody's aware of changes at the station is that units three and four are gonna go into something called coal reserve uh, at the end of this year. And what that basically means, the best way to explain it is it just basically gets mothballed. So everything kind of gets put in a state where it can stay maintained, ready if it's needed, but it won't be operated, um, at least for the foreseeable future. But it'll be there if conditions change and those units are needed. So now let's talk about what ash ponds we have and the process that we went through. So across the state, um, we've got a, a site at Chesapeake, two at Chesterfield, uh, three ponds at Remo, and five at Possum Point. And so those ponds have been there various years, but from the 1940s on up through 1980s, some of the most recent ones. In the case of Possum Point, there was originally five ponds, ponds A, B, C, D, and E, and those were consolidated. So the ash was dug up, and if you've gone down the road, you've kind of seen this activity. The ash has been dug up from ponds A, B, C, and E as an echo, and consolidated in Delta, D pond, all right? And that pond has a, has a, a clay liner, and all the ash from that site has been moved to that, to that one pond, and we're in the process of closing out the, the ponds and getting the permit for the ponds where the ash has been removed. So at this point, probably 99% of the ash from those ponds has been removed and put into one central pond, which is furthest away from the shore. Um, so in 2015, EPA came out with regulations 
um, largely due to some incidents in Kingston, uh, Tennessee, where there was actually a, one of the dams failed in that case. And then another one that uh, Duke Energy had in North Carolina a couple years later. And as a result of that, they came out with a rule that basically said all these ponds, if they don't meet certain standards, have to close. So they were getting rid of that as a means for managing uh, coal ash unless they met certain standards, which most of the ponds didn't, didn't meet. So that meant you had to close. And the rule lays out two options. So you can either uh, cap it in place, which is the method that's been used for all the landfills in Virginia that operated before there were liners, um, or you can remove all the ash. So those are your two options. And when you remove it, you have a couple options. You can either take it to a landfill that has the standard liner that's required now, um, or you can take it to, um, uh, to be recycled. All right, so those are the two options if you dig it up and what you can do. But one of the key things that we're working against here is that the federal government put um, a timeline into the rule that basically said once closure is triggered, you have 15 years to complete it. So that way they put kind of a time on it so that the ponds got closed because the, the whole purpose of this rule was to prevent another incident like what happened in Kingston where there was a pond that set open, it wasn't maintained properly, inspected, and there was a failure. So their goal was to make sure these sites closed and those are the options for closure. You can dig it up or you can cap it in place. So shortly after 2015 and the rule came out, um, some of you that have been involved and, and followed along saw the water permit that came out. That was to basically treat the water in the pond. So that pond had operated for, for many years, but it operated in a very different format where water came in with ash mixed in with it. It was pumped hydraulically. The ash settled out and then water was discharged off the top. Um, what was different once we started moving towards closing these ponds is now we were actually pumping out. So now we were stirring up the ash. So that's why there was a water permit issued with very stringent water requirements uh, for sampling, uh, limits that were placed on the discharge that comes from the treatment system. And so for about two years, we had a treatment system up there operating. Um, it basically had, had numerous stages to it. It was about a two and a half million dollar a month treatment system, just to give you kind of an idea of the scale of, of the kind of uh, you know, really high tech system that we had up there treating water. We, we have since stopped that and really have kind of in a holding pattern until there's a decision forward on how the pond's closed, rather than continually operating. Every time it rains, it makes more water in the pond. So it made sense just to hold tight until there was a path forward. So now about the, the legislation, there's been, been two rounds, and Senator Surville was obviously involved in, in, in both of those. Um, the first one required us to do a study that, that basically looked at multiple options. We looked at what does it take to take it to a landfill? What does it take to recycle it? Um, if you do close it in place, how is it going to be safe? How is it going to be structurally sound? All right, all those things we had to look at. And we provided that report. And then the follow-on session this past year, the bill that was passed asked for us to actually go out and do a request for proposals. So we reached out to different companies. We came up with a market assessment of what was out there um, in 1398. This took it to another level of refinement where you're actually getting bids from the companies that do or claim to have technology to do the recycling of the ash. So I already touched on a little bit of this, but just a couple things here. Um, as I said, all the ponds except for D have been excavated. It's all been consolidated. Clay line pond. And you know, we, Dominion does recycle about five, 500,000 tons of, of coal combustion residuals a year. But all of that is, is dry ash. So that's ash coming straight out of a station, not ash from a pond. We haven't done that yet. There are other people doing it in the country, and we'll, we'll talk about some of those people. Um, but we do have experience with with recycling in the concrete and in the wall board at our operating facilities. So let's talk about the recycling for a minute and then I'll get into the RFP results. So with the recycling in these ponds, there's a few steps that have to be taken. So first, you gotta get the water out. 
And that's a process we started a couple years ago. It would resume if you were going to recycle or remove or cap in place. You all, all of them you have to remove the water. And when you remove the water, that process is, is costly because you've got the limits that you've got to hit to ensure protection of, of Quantico Creek. Then you have to scoop out the ash. It then gets screened. And what they do in the screening is they pick out big chunks or bottom ash, the stuff that's on the bottom. The fly ash is really what they're after, what gets caught by the air pollution control equipment. They take that material out, they screen it, they dry it, and then it goes through a number of different technologies. So some people use electrostatic to separate carbon. Um, others actually burn it again, like kind of put it through a little mini boiler that burns off the excess carbon. And it's all driven towards getting it in a condition that it can substitute for Portland cement. And so that's, that's the main market out there where the ash gets placed into a cement where it's bound and in there kind of permanently. Um, you can also you know, make a uh, cinder block out of it. Uh, that bottom ash works pretty well on that, but the, the flash does as well. Um, you can also use it to make aggregate. So you can actually kind of make a cinder block, but then you break it into little chunks. And those little chunks can go in with cement to make concrete. That way you don't have to use gravel and get it from a mine, some granite mine or something like that. So those are kind of the options out there. So we did the RFP following the Senate Bill 807. And we reached out to the companies that we had heard from and Senator Surabell and, and others had, had heard from these different companies. So we reached out to them. And then we also reached out to an organization called the American Coal Ash Association. It's, it's a nationwide association that represents people who do recycling and do management of, of coal ash. And they distributed the request for proposal to all their membership across the country. And, and we got some great response. Initially, we had about 50 different individuals or companies that came in for the first information meeting. Um, that got narrowed down a little bit into the 30 range because some of them teamed up or some decided they weren't interested. And then at the end of the day, we ended up with a total of, of 12 proposals. And I, and I will say those 12 proposals were from, from 10 companies. So the 10 companies, um, two of them gave like duplicate bids. So what they did is they said, hey, if we just get one site, this is what we can do for each site. And then two of those companies said, if you give us all four, we can do all four, and this is what it would look like. So that's why there's 12 proposals, but only 10 companies. Um, the bids we considered were that, what's called encapsulated beneficial use. So that's when you actually make it into a concrete or wall board or something where it's bound. That way there's no leaching from whatever you make. And the cost ranges that came back for Possum Point, where we have about 4 million cubic yards, in, in Pond D now, Delta, uh, range between 216 million and, and 727 million. So there's a pretty wide range in cost between the bidders, depending on their technology that they use, what market they were targeting, how they were transporting it, all those things factor in. Um, the, the second column here is this, is, this is straight from the bids, exactly what the bidders said it would cost. This adds in the additional project management, oversight, running, managing the contracts. Um, so this is more the, the, the real world number, but in the report, we stuck to strictly what the bid said from the contractors that sent it in. In particular, to Possum Point, um, we had three vendors that bid, that had compliant bids, met all the requirements, included digging up the material, treating it, getting it ready, and then processing it for recycling. So of those three, they, they have similar targets that they're looking for. So they're, they're, they're looking at a market of about 200 mile radius around the site. And then they're looking at a longer radius outside of that, that is about uh, 700,000 tons or so that they can treat. So they're looking at a local market that they want to get to by truck, and then they're looking at a longer range market that widens how much they can recycle that they want to get to by rail, all right? And so of the three, um, two of them were going to truck the material, one of them is going to rail it. So 
for the trucking option, for those two bidders, it ranged between 105 and 114 trucks a day. Um, that would last for seven to 11 years, depending on the number of trucks a day, varying between those. Um, so that would be, you know, trucks taking that material to the local market. So there were kind of two different approaches here. Uh, one of the two companies that, are, that proposed to truck it was going to build a, a plant on site, you know, to process the ash, get it ready to go in the Portland cement market, and then they would take it by truck straight to concrete manufacturers. Like when you're driving down the highway and you see those little ready mix plants on the side of the road where they're making concrete for some job, some bridge, whatever it might be, they would take their stuff straight to them. Um, the, the second bidder that was going to use trucks, they would actually get the material, they would only do like a drying, an initial step, and then they want to put it in a truck and take it to an existing facility that they have in Maryland, where they would then do the further processing to get the carbon out so that it could be used in Portland cement. The third bidder um, proposed to do it all by rail. Um, they have contracts with folks in Florida and uh, I think Georgia as well, but mostly Florida. So their plan was to load the ash in the rail cars. Um, they would do a pretty substantial uh, rebuild and expansion of the rail spur that exists because that's how coal used to come into the station when we used to burn coal there. So they would rebuild that rail spur and then use that as a means to get the ash out of the site. Um, the, the trucking is, is typically the, the lower cost of the two compared to the rail, and that just has to do with the extra handling. And what I mean by that is, if you load it into a truck and take it to a landfill or take it to a, um, a recycler, then you just drive up and you unload. But with a rail, you have to load the rail car, you get it where you're going, you have to unload the rail car into a truck and then take it up. So usually you get a cost saving sometimes with rail when you look at just truck versus rail transportation but the extra handling um, adds a little into that for the, um, the the two trucking options one um, would process about 50 percent of it would be recycled the other 50 percent would go uh, into a landfill just because of that 15-year clock the market can't handle sending all of it in uh, the other truck um, who's taking it to Maryland has the storage and the processing ability they say to recycle it all um, and then for the third one the, the rail operation they would only be able to um, recycle about 38 percent of the ash in that 15 year time frame so just to give you a perspective it's, a, it's for most of the bids is a combination of going to a landfill and going to um, uh, and, and going to a uh, recycler. Again, just because once you trigger closure, which happens here in a few months, then you only have 15 years to be done. Regardless of what you do, dig it up, recycle, landfill, whatever it is. Another uh, update at the station is back in early November. Um, we've been doing groundwater monitoring at the site for a long time. Um, but in particular, when that rule became effective in 2015, it laid out a, a whole new groundwater monitoring program. So it had things that we had never sampled for before. It had never been a requirement. Um, we had to install additional wells around the ponds. And so we've now done two years of background sampling around Pond D. And we've now gotten to the point where we've collected the, the compliance monitoring events. And you know all that data has come back below all the health base limits across all the wells around Pond D. Um, we're also monitoring around Pond A, B, C, and E, where the ash has now been removed. That's on a little bit of a, a further back timeline compared to Pond D, because Pond D still has the, the ash in it. Um, but after uh, working with Senator Surabell and his recommendation, the, pond, the, the, the drinking, or I'm sorry, the, the monitoring wells along the, um, the border, along the Echo Pond there, along the Beaver Pond, if you've seen that when you drive in and out, we've been monitoring those wells for the last two and a half years every two weeks. And all of those results have been below the health-based limits as well. Um, so 
with that, there's there's kind of two standards of the rule. One is the federal government is based on health-based limits. So limits that are safe to drink. If you're over those, it triggers a corrective action. So we're below those. In the state, DEQ has a more stringent adoption of the federal rule that basically says if the concentration is higher down gradient than it is up gradient, then you have to do something about it. All right, so we have a no health-based concern from the groundwater results, but the results down gradient, right, are higher than the up gradient in three wells for two things. So with that, we'll be working with the state on any cleanup that's necessary on a path forward. Um, we've been sampling in Quantico Creek now for uh, several years and comparing it to the other creeks in the area. All those numbers um, are consistent among the water bodies, showing that the Quantico Creek is comparable to the other creeks that we're not <laughs> connected to. Um, and we're going to continue to work forward with the state and federal regulators to do what we need to do on the groundwater front. Um, on the recycling front or closure front, whatever path forward that is, you know, we're working with the General Assembly. We've given this report that kind of defines what the recycling options look like, coming straight from the recycling companies that do the work. And, um, you know, we'll work with them to answer questions as they decide what's the best path forward for the ponds at, at Possum as well as the other stations. So just next steps, um, there is a presentation to uh, the Colash subcommittee. So the subcommittee was set up from House of Delegates and Senate and the Senate um, to actually review the report and oversee kind of the path forward, what's, what's, what should be done with the ash ponds for closure. So we have that meeting coming up um, in, in just a couple weeks from now, or actually only a week from now. And what we're seeing is, for the most part in, in you know, the eastern part of the country, is most utilities are, are kind of approaching a, some sort of a hybrid approach on closure. So they're not digging it all up. They're not capping it all in place either. They're taking a site-by-site -site evaluation, deciding what's the best approach for each one. Um, and so that's what is likely a, you know, an ideal path forward, um, as most of the eastern part of the country is. Um, and again, just some of the options that are there. Um, obviously, we talked about recycling, we talked about landfilling. You know, another option is when you cap it in place and you put this liner over the top of it and then two feet of soil, there's also other things you can do to address any groundwater concerns. Do in situ stabilization, all that means is you basically mix in grout to turn it into kind of concrete in place. or you can put in interception trenches or pump and trees. So there are some other options that are more than just capping on place. And that's what we're seeing from other utilities across the country as well. So with that, I'll turn it around. Great. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. So uh, uh, and you can ask them some questions here in just a second. I just want to say a few things. I don't see Jennifer or Delegate Carol Foyer yet, but uh, I know she's on her way. Uh, I'm going to talk really quick. I just want to give you some context about what's going on around the rest of the state on this because this issue that we have to legislate about, it's not just about cost and point. We have to legislate for all four sites. So I think it's important for everybody to have a little bit of context about that. And then I want to talk about the legislation, at least, that I'm thinking about uh, introducing. And, uh, and, uh, and then uh, I guess that's about it. So let me give you some context. As, as you heard up here, there's four different sites. Right, there's Possum Point. You go out Possum Point Road, you go out there, there's a big dam up on your left. There are three ponds that used to be down by the creek, they've been dug up and moved. There's a big dam on the left. There's 120 acres, 120 acres of coal ash there, four million cubic yards sitting behind that dam. It's all been consolidated in one place. Okay, and it's, it's up in the air. Um, it was an old stream valley, they put a big dam at the end of the stream valley, and they put all the coal ash behind it. And a little, you know, some, some rivulets and things come out of the dam, right by Brian West's house, uh, and uh, then out to the creek. And so, that's just some context on Possum Point. The other sites, uh, Remo Bluffs, that's between sort of Richmond and, Sh and uh, Charlottesville and James River. That's the site that's kind of the closest to Possum Point, I would say. It's up over the James River, but the James River there is just moving water. It's not tidal, it's not still water. And 
there's a few slides back I think that showed you a little bit about I mean, we've already missed it, but there's a few slides that show how much is there. There's a lot of there's a lot of Brema, but it's up above the James River. The other two sites are a lot trickier. Chesapeake site, um, Dominion constructed a peninsula made of coal ash into the middle of the Elizabeth River. So, you know, we can we can look with 2020 vision what people chose to do back then, but they actually constructed basically a finger sticking into the river made out of coal ash in the river, and, uh, and then they covered it up. You know, it's not it's not like the stuff is like falling off into the river or anything. But there's a massive pile of coal ash basically sitting in the river with riprap around it, and that needs to be moved. Uh, the other one is Chesterfield, and that's the big one. Chesterfield, the Chesterfield coal ash pond is actually used to be the James River. About 100 years ago, the James River used to run in a big loop, and somebody thought we need to save the ship some time, so they cut a little canal across it, <coughs> cut the loop off. So you had this big loop that used to be the river, and the coal ash pond is actually what used to be the river. And all the coal ash was dumped into what used to be the river. And so all that coal ash sits below the water table. And it's sealed off from the, from, you know, it's partially sealed off, but in any event, it sits below the water table. And so we have to design legislation that has the ability to deal with all these situations and all these different site conditions. And, um, and it can't just be, a, it can't be a one, it, it kind of sort of has to be a one size fits all approach, but with flexibility. So we just can't think about Boston Point all alone. I have to get the votes of 100, you know, 51 delegates, 21 senators. There's other people who care about the sites in their districts, so we have to take their, their views into account as well. Uh, so another thing I want to tell you about the uh, about these other sites is that the, the water testing data that's been done shows that every single one of the four sites is leaking, okay? And, um, uh, Jason just described it a second ago uh, with more technical terms than I just used, but they are all leaking. Um, at Possum Point, they haven't found enough leakage to where it constitutes a water quality violation, but they have determined that the ponds are leaking. That's what the data shows. Um, and um, I know I have a couple constituents here that will tell you that their water, the test from their wells shows that they've got heavy metals in their water and their wells. Uh, but the official tests that have been done haven't shown violations. They've shown leakage, but not violations. There have been tests that have shown violations, I believe, at Chesterfield, uh, or exceedances, they like to call it. So test results that exceed the, the health violations. I think at Chesterfield, I think it's the only one. Uh, so these things are leaking everywhere. It's not really, really, really badly yet, okay? Um, and then, uh, let's see. The next thing I wanna tell you about is, you know, I've been working on this since April of 2015 now. And uh, when we started working on this, the coal ash recycling community and a lot of the concrete producers came to me and said, uh, we really would like to have more coal ash. I never thought that, uh, I never realized that you used coal ash to make concrete, but VDOT told me they make some of the best concrete they've made in years using coal ash. And uh, we have two legislators who actually were in the, con one's still in the concrete industry, another one used to be in the concrete industry, and they both tell me that they can't get a consistent enough supply of coal ash, so they have to use something else. But if they had coal ash, they would prefer to use coal ash. So they have a shortage of it. Last session, I was in, on concrete day, we have concrete day in Richmond, a bunch of concrete providers came to visit me, and it was like eight different concrete guys came into my office to tell me about concrete. And one of them said that they have a sales office on Old Bridge Road, and they are a concrete precast company. That means they make the sewer pipes, or like the sewer grates, the things, you know, where they, when, they, you know, when they build the sewer, they just drop a box in the ground, and they plug the pipes into it, they make it back to their factory, they haul it in a truck and just drop it in the ground. They have a, a, coal, they have a, a concrete plant where they make precast concrete in Frederick, Maryland. They have a sales office on Old Bridge Road. And they told me that they had a cargo ship sitting in the port of Baltimore with 20,000 cubic yards of Italian coal ash in it because they couldn't find enough coal ash in this area to satisfy their coal ash needs for their concrete plants. So they're importing it from Europe so they can make concrete coal ash in Frederick, Maryland to sell in Northern Virginia. So just to give you an idea of 
the need for coal ash that's out there. Part of the reason there's a problem is because everybody stopped, all the utilities just stopped burning coal. And so there's less and less coal around to create coal ash to satisfy the need, which is why a lot of these recyclers are, are would really like to recycle. And so that's just a data point that I think it's important to understand in terms of why we need to push this towards recycling, from my point. Um, now in terms of, um, before, the last thing I want to say before I talk about the legislation is, if you all remember, the original proposal before, before I passed the bill in 2016 that created the moratorium, and before we passed the bill in 2017, which required the study, where it was a moratorium and a study, and then before we passed the bill in 17, it required the study you just saw the results of. The original proposal was just to do what's called cap in place, which is that um, Dominion originally wanted to just consolidate all five of the ponds at Possum Point and all the, the ponds at Bremont, the ponds at Chesapeake, Chesterfield, put them all in one place. They wanted to put a, I, I don't know what you call it, some kind of earth and rubber thing, you probably have a technical term for it, but it's a, a barrier, a rubber barrier on it, put some dirt on top of that, plant grass, dig some wells, and then monitor cross your fingers and hope things don't leak, okay? And that was the original proposal. The idea is if you put that rubber tarp on it, it's not tarp, the rubber barrier, when the rain hits it, the rain will run off and the water won't go in it, but that doesn't protect it, the water from underneath or the water coming from the side. Uh, and I didn't like that idea, which is why I put in the two bills that I put in and said we really need to look at other alternatives like either digging it up and hauling it away, which is called clean closure, or recycling. Uh, and so, that's the information we just we just got. The first, this first set of reports we got said that this was all going to be really expensive unless we just capped in place. But the second bill we passed last year said go out to the go out to the recycling community, make them make contract proposals to you, make them put their money where their mouth is to propose what they can do so we can find out what the real numbers are. And that's that's what you just saw. So the legislation that we're throwing around right now, we don't have actual language yet. People are drafting it. But at least what myself, I know Delegate Carol Foy is talking about, is putting a cap in place, a, a prohibition on cap in place, which is a, a something in the code that says nobody is allowed to cap in place, period. We're not going to leave this stuff where it is in these old clay lined, semi clay lined, partially lined ponds and put a tarp on it, or a rubber barrier on top. I don't, I've heard other people use more technical language, but a really thick rubber thing on it to keep the water out. Um, so we're not going to do that. We're either going to recycle or clean clothes, dig it up and haul it away. One of those two. Uh, secondly, we're going to try and recycle as much as we can in the time period that EPA has given us, right? And part of what part of what we're worried about in terms of recycling is whether there's enough market demand for all the ash we can recycle. I mean, there's a ton of this stuff. I think it's 24 million cubic yards around the entire state. And if we were to recycle all that in five years, we couldn't sell it because there's not enough demand for that. And there's worry and concern about whether there's not enough demand over 15 years. But we want to recycle as much as we can. And whatever we can't recycle, we dig up and put in a properly lined landfill. And interestingly, North Carolina, which has a lot more of this than we do, is digging up a lot of theirs and moving it to a landfill in Virginia. Oh. Uh, so it's a landfill in Amelia County where a lot of this stuff is being taken by rail. Uh, and so you know, there's landfills this could be disposed of in Virginia, but that's probably the most expensive option, especially if you put it in rail cars. Uh, at least the way it was explained to me, the problem with rail cars is you've got to actually put it in bags. You've got to dig it up, put it in bags, then put the bag in the car, then when you get the car to unload it, you've got to take the bag out of the car, take it out of the bag, dump it. Whereas if you put it in a dump truck, just put it in a dump truck and drive the truck away. So. Uh, in any event, that, that rail option is really expensive. But that's what we're talking about in terms of legislation. In addition to that, one other, there's two other, very, two other things you have to take into account, you have to think about when you're thinking about policy solutions to this. Um, the big one is cost recovery, which is who's going to pay for all this? Okay? Because, um, well, so let me, let me just talk about that. So the way utility regulation works in this state, is that is that when Dominion spends money to create electricity, they get to recover the cost of that from their ratepayers, right? The state grants them a monopoly. We grant them the right to make a certain amount of money, and we have this entity called the State Corporation Commission, which looks over everything they do to make sure that they're being honest about what it is they're charging, whether their numbers are right, and make sure that they're doing things consistent with the policies that we set as a legislature. Okay, and, and what this 
this cost falls into is pollution control, right? Um, what, what they've been doing with coal ash for the last 60 years, nothing illegal about it. They've been doing the same thing every utility in the rest of the United States has been doing. Uh, they've been keeping it in ponds, in wet storage ponds, just like every other utility in the country. And what happened is EPA came in after there was a super ash, a super fun site created in Tennessee after a dam broke. EPA came in and said, we're not going to keep it in water anymore. We want it kept in modern landfills. And so uh, EPA has changed the rules. Now the EPA has changed the rules, how we're going to control this pollution. It's a pollution control bus, just like pollution coming out of the smokestack. Or just, for example, if, if EPA had said, we're going to change the rules on how we keep nuclear waste. If EPA had said, you can't keep nuclear waste this way anymore, you got to change it. And it was going to cost an extra billion dollars to do it. That's a cost that we would have to pay because we that's what it costs to turn the light on. It's part of pollution. And so we have there's a, that second issue about how we're going to allow them to recover the cost. And there's different rules about that. They can recover the cost in a year, in five years, in 20 years. We could say they can only recover part of it or all of it. There's, there's, but that's a, something we have to think about. And I can just tell you, for people who don't have a coal ash deposit site in their legislative district, okay, somebody who's, whose district is on the other side of the Shenandoah Valley, nowhere near this, they don't want to pay for this, right? And so, as legislators, that's also an issue that we have to balance in terms of selling this to our colleagues as to, you know, why we need to do this and, and at what cost we need to do it at. And so, um, from my perspective, the original proposal that they made, the cap and place option, I think that was about $1.8 billion, something like that, it cost the cap and place. The, the most expensive option for recycling, I think, was around $5 billion. So it was only about twice as expensive, maybe maybe two and a half, maybe two and a half times more expensive. And for, from my perspective, it's a lot cheaper for all of us across the entire state to do it right the first time instead of, you know, do the cheap version and cross our fingers and hope, you know, we don't give a bunch of people cancer and pollute everything. And so, um, from my perspective, we ought to just, you know, bite the bullet and do the recycle as much as we can pass the cost through as best we can. Uh, and we're still figuring out the cost recovery piece. But that's kind of where I'm headed on this. And I'm hopeful I can persuade my colleagues of this. We have a meeting on December 17th next week. Joint Commerce Committees are meeting to talk about all this, to try and figure out if there's common ground on it. Uh, but I wanted to give you all a chance to uh, ask questions, hear what, hear what they have to say, and ask questions especially before I have to go back to Richmond on December 17th to try and figure out if there's consensus. Uh, and the last thing I want to say, the very last thing, is that um, I've also been trying to think through in my head other requirements that we might want to create on this legislation to deal with the situation. So for example, if the, the truck numbers that they just threw up there, the 105 trucks or whatever it was, 115 trucks, in an eight hour period, that's one truck every four minutes down Boston Point Road, right? And, um, yeah, right, so one in, one out, so it's probably like one every two minutes maybe, but yeah, yeah. Uh, one going one way two minutes, one going the other way two minutes, but uh, if uh, that's going to do some damage on the road, and, and you know, I, I have some ideas about who ought to pay for that, uh, but if there's some infrastructure costs that are created because of things like that happening, uh, I also think this is an opportunity to get our schools involved in looking at this stuff. There's lots of interesting innovation and science going on with people trying to figure out new and different ways to recycle this besides just making it into something for concrete. Somebody showed me, the, somebody came and met me the other day in South Korea, they're taking this stuff, they melt this coal ash, they turn to fiber for paperboard and they make it into insulation instead of just using it for concrete. Other people have shown me they can use it to make other products out of, not just concrete. So. I think there's some opportunities for education for our children in Prince William County. There's opportunities to teach kids how to do groundwater monitoring. There's lots of things we can do in our schools that I think we can do with this. Um, and also, Dominion also has uh, some nice waterfront property there. It'd be nice to have some water access. So there's some things I've been thinking about in my head to try and uh, other things I think we might be able to ask for as part of this. And, and I'm, I'm curious about your feedback on that. So um, having said that, I don't see Jennifer here yet, but I know she's coming. Um, Luke, and I, Luke, I don't think Luke has anything. You want to add anything? So I guess we can start the Q and A. Anybody can ask any questions. And I don't know, if Jason, you want to come back up, or anybody else? You may come back up. Your hand is up first. 
Major concern with the, the trucks. Right. I did the calculation between a half a million to 1.5 million truck routes back and forth. Over the entire period of time. Yes, over the entire period. Right. Uh, it's just, we had a similar problem with uh, the removing dirt from the power plant uh, to bolster some townhouses. And that was a big disaster. The trucks were tearing up the road. They're all over the road. The, the shoulders weren't designed for it. The roads weren't designed for it initially. And the, the trucks, you know, they're noisy. They're banging all the time. So for the residents, it's a big problem, the trucking. And major the problem. Speed limit. And the speed limit. And we had a similar issue with the ethanol plant. And we showed that the trucks That's just made, north of the power plant, right? This was different than the power it's plant. just north of the power plant on the peninsula. Yeah. It's out there. Yeah. They wanted to put ethanol down there. And they were also having trucks moving back and forth. It was shown that the trucks would tear up the road. They were very dangerous, and they never went through that. So to me, the logic is, I don't understand how the cost can be that far different from the, the rail to the trucks. You've got to pay each truck trucker. you got to pay the gas for the truck. you got to pay the, you know, the loading of the truck and everything. The, the rail cars are 10 times bigger, you know, just loaded in there. So we don't, I, I personally don't have a problem with it getting rid of the coal ash, but I do have a major problem that the trucks are running beside my house all day long, banging and banging. That will completely destroy that uh, environment that we're living in okay. on both sides. Okay. So it's a major problem. Jason, you want to explain why the difference between rail transport and truck transport why it costs so much more yeah so we um, one we we didn't limit the bidder we, we said truck rail barge those are all options at possum point look at it and come up with your proposal how you're going to handle it so two had trucking but one did have rail um, and the reason for the for the additional cost is in a in a truck because you're right you've got the gas you've got the trucker you've got all that all that gets loaded into the truck, truck gets covered, and then the truck goes off to the landfill or it goes to a Portland cement manufacturer, it dumps, it turns around and drops back. Um, where the additional comes in with the rail is that they have to load it, and, and like Senator Surabell said, they either load it into to bags or they line the entire container, put it in, fold it over, um, in some cases, the Duke site that uh, Senator Servo referenced, they actually do that and then they have a, a hard top that sits on top of the container too. So they have to do all that to load it. Then they train it off wherever they're taking it. And then they unload and put it into a truck and then take it to a landfill or take it to a recycler. So it's that extra step of handling is where the costs add up. And then for, for some of them, um, the one company that said that for Possum Point, they would do train. So they have a facility they're gonna take, or several facilities that they're primarily taking it to. It's off of a rail spur, they can stop, they can unload, put it, put it in trucks and go off to the various different places that they're going to. So we're just shifting the truck traffic, the truck, truck traffic to another area. But for the other two bidders, the reason they did trucks was that they want to supply people within 200 miles that don't have rail, like those ready mix plants when you go down the highway. You know, those don't have rail access to on the side of the road. So that's why they did that. And I'm not advocating for either one. I'm just saying that's what the three bidders came back with for Possum and why they chose what they chose and why they justified the cost that they proposed in their proposal. But you did not figure the cost of yeah. preparing the roads. I mean, no, that's, have, that wasn't included. If you have a million truckloads running all over Virginia, they're going to be hurting highways. Hurting. I mean, the banging on the trucks. It's just, it's just natural. It's just an engineering phenomenon. Yeah, we, so, so you need to look at that, too. And we did. Because Possible Point, after those truckers, you should have seen the condition of that road. It was hard. I mean, it was completely torn up. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a residential road, I man. It's not, yeah. not intended for that. The shoulders we, of this line. We did ask 
Um, the bidders, all the bidders came in for interviews to ask questions, make sure we understood what they're submitting. We did ask them for the truck ones if it included wear and tear, things like that. They said no, um, but they did acknowledge that, you know, that, that that would likely happen. <coughs> that would be something that had to be addressed, but they didn't include it in their proposal. Well, we should be the victim of economics here. Yeah. People living on Fossil Point Road. Yeah, so let me just tell you, also, with regard to your uh, your issue, that Senator, Senator Dance represents the, the uh, Chesterfield site. And the Chesterfield site, I think the report said 300 trucks a day. And they have the exact same issues with the road that goes to the Chesterfield site and the homes are along that. And so this truck versus train issue is not only an issue for Fossil Point, it's also an issue Chesterfield site as well and something that we're we're trying to balance and you know you're not I know you're not the only person I, Eileen has mentioned this to me as a, an issue for her at, on, on Boston Point Road. I'm not sure it's an issue for everybody. But all right. No. I get I get I get it and and again it, it's an issue I'm sensitive to what the, but you know I'm the, we need to figure out we need to figure out as legislators whether our colleagues are willing to pay for it. Uh, I mean, all that stuff came in by rail car. All that coal came in by rail. That's how it got there. And you know, it'd be nice if we could get it out by rail, but you've heard what the cost is. Um, and I'd love to do it that way. I just don't know if my colleagues will be willing to allow their constituents to pay for it. So that's kind of where I am on it, but, I pre but that's good feedback and I appreciate that. So. What, what, are the, what are the critical chemicals that are causing carcinogen and stuff in the coal? I mean, what, what is... What is the most dangerous chemicals in there? It's, uh, it, it leaches out lithium, I mean uh, lead, lithium, hexavalent chromium, uh, uh, those are the arsenic. Arsenic, arsenic, yeah, arsenic, yeah, cadmium, yeah, yeah, cobalt. Yeah, cobalt, that's the other one I was thinking. That's, Luke, you want to say something? What do you want to do? We've seen several hands go up. Yeah. So the, the best way to do it is give you guys a number so we can take you. So one, two, three, and four. Okay. And you're five. You're five. Then, we, then we'll start on a one, yeah. two, three, four, and you're five. Number one. You're going to put the question. You mentioned the bar issue. So, and by the way, can you just mention your name too so I just know who you are? I think I met you. Tom Starr. Tom Starr, okay. Now you're from Facebook. Right, right. Yes, okay. And, uh, uh, the question about a large issue. What's the economic analysis? Speak up. Okay. He wants to know what the economic analysis of, is of using a barge to ship it. Yes, we, we looked at that in the original report, the 1398 report. I don't remember those numbers off the top of my head. Um, in the Senate Bill 807, what we just finished, none of the bidders selected barging as their option. Um, and I, I can't speak for them, but you know, some of the challenges with the barging is there's a lot of infrastructure improvements because the barge facility now is just there to accept oil, so it's just like a pipeline. So we'd have to be able to handle somehow getting the ash out there. And then also in Virginia, um, they have a they have a um, a rule about transportation of, of waste in Virginia on state waters. So you can't do like an open top barge, like you might see like scrap or something going down the river. So when you have to start putting it in basically like watertight shipping containers and loading those, stacking those, that makes the economics less favorable. Um, so, and then I think, you know, there's also, do you, do you want to put if you're concerned about the ash, do you want to put it on a boat and sink it, to, you know, run it down the river? I don't know that that makes the most sense either. But it was an option that was laid out to them. They chose not to do that. Uh, there was one site, uh, the Chesapeake site, where there's a different arrangement with the with the uh, dock, where a company did propose that, but but none did it possible. Jason, my recollection is the barging option was the most expensive transportation yeah. option in the assessment that was done a year ago. That's Absolutely. my recollection. I the numbers, but yeah, it was like the most expensive. Pushing it towards $14 billion or $12 yeah. billion. Dollars and it had to do with those little containers that have to be yeah. stacked on and then all the other structure. Who was number two? Yeah. Oh, I'm not sure. I thought it was number three. <laughs> All right. Hi, my name is Tiziana. Um, I'm with the Greater Prince William Climate Action Network. I'm also uh, with a uh, community organizer for Mothers Out Front. So I don't only represent myself, I represent a community of concerned mothers, of concerned uh, citizens and residents, and so on and so forth. Um, so I have a few questions. One is, uh, 
who is testing the water for contamination? Because you mentioned that the Europeans, you test in the water, it's totally safe, totally fine. Uh, why should we trust it? And uh, is there is there an independent uh, party testing it? That's 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 one of my questions. Um, so the other question, uh, very quickly, is why the hell? Excuse my language. Are we paying for this? Uh, I. I, 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 me as a private citizen, if I damage something, uh, someone can sue me and, I, and you know I have to pay for the damages. Uh, I, who knows, I could face prison, whatever. I, I don't understand why we have this humongous problem here. 86, about, I think 86% of industrial pollution comes from this plant, collage, whatever, in, in, in our area, in our county. And I have this little map saying that we have unhealthy air due to smog and thanks to Dominion, um, that's you know, that's, that's, that's why. So besides the problem that it's causing with the water, the ground, the air, it's causing health issues, uh, many more asthma cases. I don't want to breathe that stuff. I don't want my kids to drink what's in that stuff. And no matter what you say, it's, it's not sufficient. Uh, we need to get the stuff out of here. Um, whatever happened in North Carolina with the hurricanes, I'm sure you guys heard of, the same thing called ash. The hurricane almost got us. Excuse me, if that hurricane reached us, that would have flooded everywhere. That would have been everywhere. We need this stuff out. Honestly, I personally do not care what it costs them. It shouldn't cost us anything because they cause a problem, so they should pay for it. If, I, if I, me as a citizen, if you're telling us we should pay for $5 billion worth of anything, I would rather be clean energy, like wind and solar. Besides that, there is the whole climate change issue and that we're heading towards, like, honestly, uh, so much trouble. So excuse me if I'm taking so long, but I just wanted to understand why are we paying for it? it. They should pay for it. And yeah, about the testing. Thank you. Thank you for sure. All right. So, well, the, I guess the two main topics. One is the the cost piece. Well, let's sooner circle we'll tie into that more. But uh, the thing to keep in mind is that you know the station started in '48. It operated, it still operates now, but operated in our coal for 2003. This is the permitted way to operate these ponds. This is what was allowed by EPA and the state DEQ. And during that time, you paid rates for your, in well, maybe not you and I, but somebody prior to us paid those rates based off of that cost associated with generating power that way. So. If that had gone off to a landfill or something else, even though back in those days, landfills didn't have liners either. They didn't have liners until 1993 across the U.S. Um, then those costs would have been included in that. So that's that's where the cost recovery conversation comes in. On the groundwater monitoring, uh, the monitoring wells around the site are monitored by a third-party engineering firm that we contract with. The result or the samples are sent to a lab that has to have a state certification in Virginia and then the results from that sampling are given to the state and they verify those, they write comments back on the annual report that they would get each year under the program. Um, in the past, they have done where the state will come out and do sampling. The state did some sampling of wells in the area that were residential wells, not the monitoring wells at the site. Uh, the state's also done surface water sampling around uh, various stations with the coal ponds. Um, so all that's been yeah, that's how that monitoring occurs. Can they volunteer? Sorry, I'm sorry, about the, the, the money question. Can Dominion voluntarily pay for it? Does it have to be a law for it? Uh, I, Is there anything I stopping can't. Dominion from taking they, care of it? Theoretically, they could, but I think they, they would probably be violating their duties to their shareholders if they did that, uh, giving away a $5 billion gift. Uh, but, you know, state law allowed them to do what they did, and they were in compliance with the law. When, when they have to pay themselves is when they break the law. So if, if, if they're shown to commit a water quality violation or an air violation, then that's a cost they have to bear on their own to fix. But if it's in compliance with the law, we pay as ratepayers. And traditionally, that's the way it's worked. Now, it doesn't have to work like that in the future. We could always change the law. We could. I, th I think it'd be hard to do, but it's we also, could. It's also not illegal for a politician to take money from Dominion. No, it's not. That makes that's sense. right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Not, not in this state, at least. Um, but, um, you know, I've, what you're saying, I've heard a lot from. But we, we wouldn't be having this discussion if EPA hadn't oh. changed the rules four years ago and said, we're not going to store like this anymore. 
And as I said earlier, to me this is just like if this was nuclear waste, right? One third of your electricity that comes out of these lights right now comes from a nuclear power plant. It, it's generating nuclear waste right now. And if EPA had changed the rules on nuclear waste and said you can't keep it however you keep it, I don't even know how to keep it. You have to do something else with it. We would have to pay for that. And that's how, that's, that's how I kind of see it, is this stuff is, it's not nuclear at least. It's not nearly as bad, but we got to do something with it. And who's number, yeah, who's number three? I have a few questions. Um, the clay on the Delta Pond, Delta D Pond? Pond D? Yeah. You mentioned that it had a clay liner, or is that just natural clay? It wasn't really a man-made? Okay. So the question was, is Pond D uh, have a clay liner in it, or was it natural clay? Yeah, it's a combination. So the, the on the bottom, the very bottom, there was a several foot thick natural clay layer. The side slopes have a foot of clay that was placed when the pond was constructed. So it's it's a combination of the two. Do they do do, they do like uh, uh, rubberize the liners? Good years in the not not the at that time. Now, now no, I mean, you, I mean now. Yeah, it, a, a modern landfill um, under the regulations has both. It has a clay liner and then it has a membrane on top of it, which is the scientific word you're looking for is the high density polyethylene. It's, yeah, right. It's, yeah. A, it's, a, it's like a uh, it's a petroleum based flexible membrane, but it's you know it's like this thick. It's it's you can't bend it very easy, but over long surfaces it, it bends slightly. Another question is uh, on your testing here semi-independent testings. Uh, you're, pay you're paying for that contractor who is, is, uh, you know, has that certification and has to go through you know, to, to inspect the clay. <coughs> is uh, that, uh, that independent contractor, is that someone that could be hired by the state and Dominion pay for it and by competitive bidding or so, anything like that? So typically... you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. yeah so, um, and let me know if I don't get it all, but, but basically what you're asking is the, the firm that does the sampling, you know, how do they maintain their impartialness or how do they, you know, what do they have to meet? And then the second part was, does the state ever hire the person and we pay the state? So um, on the first one, so they're a engineering consulting firm, so they have a license with the state of Virginia. So if they were to miss uh, you know, misrepresent something, falsify results, anything like that, then they could lose their, you know, their, their uh, ability to do that business. And, and the firms we use are the larger firms that do this across the nation, have experience, and at the end of the day, we're a small fraction of their total revenue. So from their perspective, we work with ethical people, but even if they were going to do something, it, it wouldn't be worth it for the small portion that we make up of theirs. It's not like they only exist because of Dominion. Do they, do they come to the site and test? Take yeah, the they come to the site and do the sampling. There's very prescriptive um, standards on what you have to do to collect the sample properly, so it's representative of what's in the groundwater. There's very prescriptive about how they handle the bottles, you know, gloves, labeling, chain of custody, and then, you know, you think about it, you go to the doctor and get like blood taken or something. You know, they, they initial everything, they fill out all the paperwork, they put it in the bag, it goes in the cooler. They do that with these groundwater samples. And then the, the, the second part was the state. Um, typically the state doesn't do that uh, just because they regulate hundreds of sites, maybe even thousands of sites to do monitoring across the state. I mean, alone there's 100, 150 landfills that are online that have been closed in place out there across the state. Um, you know, in addition to our coal ponds, there's other coal ponds in southwest Virginia that aren't subject to all these bills. They're closed in place. So, you know, there's a lot of sites across the state. So typically they don't do that because they don't have the manpower or the resources to sample all of those. Uh, but one, one, one other question. Um, in, the, in the recycling portion of it, the, the heavy metals that are, that are separated where does that take place does that take place at the recycling place that you're contracting with or does that take place before they pick it up so the, so the question was where do the heavy metals get pulled apart from the ash during the recycling and the answer is it, they don't <clears throat> what they do is they like i talk about they, they dry it out they screen out the big pieces you know things because they need a certain size and then they use several different technologies but all they're trying to get rid of is the carbon 
because you can't have too much carbon in the ash or it can't be used in, as a Portland cement substitute. So they either burn off the excess carbon, which kind of is like a little miniature power station, you know, or they have like electrostatic. There's just different technologies that people have come up with and other, other ones that, you know, may come up someday. Um, <clears throat> but the heavy metals stay in it um, and then that gets bound into that piece of concrete that it eventually goes into. So that's how those get managed under that. So, so uh, center blocks like this, is that considered <laughs> part of the recycling? Yeah, in fact, that, um, so if you yeah, drill it or saw it, they make boiler ash, they make <laughs> cinder blocks out of boiler ash. But if you drill it or saw it, are you telling me that you could get, you could be breathing heavy metals? Uh, I mean, they, would, they would don't you, leach with water. I know yeah, that. Yeah, they don't leach with water, which is the standard that they have on it. I don't, I don't know about the, the air piece for, for the cinder blocks. Yeah. Who's number four? I have uh, two questions. One for the So, uh, your name? Dean Nash, Comic River Keeper. Um, I appreciate your leadership on this issue. I, I do feel like you're this, doing this community a little bit of a disservice by downplaying serious public health threats. I know you touched on them and I appreciate all your work you've done for them. But in North Carolina, they tested 360 drinking wells around Duke Energy's coal ash ponds and 330 of those drinking wells were contaminated with heavy metals like vanadium, hexavalent chromium, and a whole host of heavy metals that you only find in coal ash. And Georgia Power now is being required to clean up 19 ash ponds or cleaning up all the ash ponds in South Carolina. So what's being asked of you as a community is not unprecedented. Coal ash is dangerous and it kills people. And, it is, and there's tons of examples of that. And I think it's just a real disservice to kind of downplay this because you're being asked to pick this up. I do agree that it should be railed out and it should be sent by barge and not trucked out. Um, and if Dominion says that they're gonna be, uh, if they always do the right thing was with their PowerPoint presentation, they should be making that happen and insisting that to all of you. And my question to you is, they said right up on their PowerPoint, there's no threats to drink water. Do you believe Dominion Power when they tell people like Brian West and Patty Morrow that there's been no threat to their drinking water? No, I have, I have explained, I thought of what I said earlier is that there's demonstrated, documented leakage currently in the groundwater at every single site. Okay. There's no- I just want to be clear. And again, from, listen, my, there's been no water quality violation documented at Possum, but there's leakage. And listen, from my point of view, it's kind of like, you know, I, I tend to be kind of a purist when it comes to environmental stuff, and so to me it's like, you know, is a little dog poop in your cookies enough, or just does it have to be more, right? I mean, once there's contamination in it, I mean, I don't think anybody wants to drink that water, right? And once that water is leaching out, it gets into the fish and the wildlife, and when the birds eat the fish, it aggregates in them and it goes up the chain, and then sooner or later, where people like the fish in the in Quantico and they're eating fish out of there, it aggregates in their body, and collects, and eventually they get cancer. And so that's why I think whatever solution we pick, we need to get it up and out of there and get it somewhere else, either get rid of it and put it in concrete, or we need to put it in the landfill where it can't leak out. Which is why I'm pushing those two solutions, why I don't support cap and put. So I think Thank I said you. that. Thank you. Um, so, Jason, um, we disagree that there's been illegal violations right. and discharges. Um, and one report, um, this was Dominion's own site characterization report for ash pods E and E that they submitted to Department of Environmental Quality back in 2004. Pond E is now closed, basically. But their own report says the primary environmental receptor for groundwater can associated with ash pond D. Ash Pond E is Quantico Creek, located approximately 400 to 1400 feet south of the site. Groundwater flows south of the site toward Quantico Creek, where it discharges into the creek. Okay, that was your own report, DEQ. Yep. And you know, you closed Ash Ponds A, B, and C, but those were also discharging the Quantico Creek for decades. We discovered your tow drain at the bottom of Pond D, which has since been plugged was discharging Dominion claimed that it was only stormwater and the state reclassified that as an industrial waste discharge requiring treatment, right? So you can dispute that, but my question to you is Dominion Power under EPA investigation for its ash ponds. 
So let me answer a few things. Just, uh, just answer that question right there. Yes, yeah, so we were requested for information by EPA on Possum Point. We provided that information from them. We've answered questions, and that's all that there is at this point. I don't know of any investigation. I know that you requested through Dumfries for them to ask information. We provided information, and they'll go from there. So I disagree with the illegal part. We always have disagreed with that. Um, the states disagree with that as well, uh, who has all the documentation to show it. Um, and you know the report you reference, and, and this gets a little technical, but when you have uh, what that was called is a, is a risk assessment, and so that's something that's required whenever there's um, you know any sort of groundwater detection, and you do this risk assessment to figure out where could it go. So the term receptors is where does the water go? It doesn't. It's not synonymous the way it was portrayed as being contamination. It's simply where does the water go? And when you look at all the wells that have been put in at Possum Point and the elevations in those wells, because when you drill a well, water will come to a certain level and it'll stay there. That's the groundwater elevation. They all do go towards Quantico Creek. So what that report says is the obvious statement that water from the area of our ponds, in fact, flows downhill, as we've all known, towards Quantico Creek. It doesn't say that there's contamination in it. Um, it just says that that's the direction the water goes. How can you have one without the other, though? I mean, that Well, there has to be sense. contamination there, right? I'm so sure there is contamination. But, but, it, but it doesn't, but keep in mind, these wells are right next to the pond. Right next to the pond. You know, within 100 feet of the pond. And the metals don't, they don't, they don't travel these long distances. And then oh, we, no? They don't, because once they get near the shoreline, that's there's ridiculous. a- ridiculous. Oh, this is science. Right. No we wanted to just try to have a yeah. quick question and answer instead of a debate. But it gets okay. oxygenated is the issue, right? And it binds in the soil. So that's it. But oh, there's so been sample. Soil okay. contamination. Hold on. Next to the pond. Ask, try to ask a question. We'll, yes, I have, oh, wait, there's number five. Yeah, Who's number five? I got, I got, I got, I got it. Who's number, five? number five here. Hold up. I got it. Number six here. Sir, ma'am, you're seven, you're eight, yeah. and you're nine. Okay, and you're 10. Okay, please remember your numbers. Okay, go ahead, sir. So, uh, my question is, uh, I'm with the Carpenters. What's my name? Gilberto. Gilberto. Okay. With the Carpenters. Uh, my question is, uh, what has been done to, to ensure that this project goes to the responsible contractors who will pay fair wages and uh, who pay taxes and they will do right the project? And uh, also, the second question is, uh, Will Dominion consider a uh, community, community uh, um, agreement to to uh, for this uh, to to, uh, to work on these issues, environmental concerns, and address these issues? What was the last part? The last part was uh, community agreement to what? Uh, community agreement to address these problems and uh, for community uh, benefits. Okay. Uh, let me just, Jason, I can take the first part. Let me just, in terms of what you just said, I've, I've left that out, but one of the pieces that we're talking about putting in our legislation is, is directing Dominion to locally source any labor associated with whatever they do. So they try to hire people in the community to do these projects instead of bringing people from all over the place in. And, um, what you said in terms of the benefits and all that, I hadn't thought about, but it's something I think we ought to consider. I'm happy to consider that. And Jason, I don't know if Jason can even tell you about what Dominion does. I know Dominion does have some unionized employees that work for them. I know that. Yeah, and, we do. Yeah. But I, he, he probably knows more about that than I do. So but leave just the rest to, Yeah, ju just to say, though, the, the, the three companies that, that bid on Possum, none of them are local companies. They're all out-of-state companies. Um, one of them does have operations in the state, uh, some of them, but they're all based elsewhere. But, um, you know, they would be getting their individual workforce and the people on the site. Our contract would be with them a prime. Um, <clears throat> on, the, um, uh, on the other part, you know, we have community meetings, the station set up where we bring and invite people in to come in, talk about the station, what's going on, the concerns meetings like this that the senator held to get feedback from everyone. 
um, and then work with both DEQ um, and the General Assembly on, on the path forward. <laughs> one, one of the things we will take a look at, if there is an out-of-state company comes in, we're certainly going to look at requiring that a percentage of their employees come from the locality here in the Commonwealth. Okay. We're going to bring a whole team of people out of town. But the, other, the other big, the other big, big issue is uh, sometimes they they hire uh, local people, but they cheat on those guys. They didn't pay fair wages and they didn't pay benefits. Yeah. Those guys. Sometimes, sometimes uh, those people don't have a voice. Right. So uh, uh, my question is: Is anything? Any agreement be going to be signed with your, the union or something? Your, your concern is well known. And yeah, we we can try to require that in the legislation. We can try, but we have to convince our colleagues to support that as well. But, but that's something that's important to delegatorian and I. Maybe you number six. I'm Elizabeth Michelson. I'm also on the leadership committee with the Tiziana Patino. Um, uh, the very great Prince William Climate Action Network and Alice uh, Crow who just spoke over there. She's a retired environmental attorney and she's also on the leadership committee. Um, I have a question also about how safe or unsafe is the pond be right now if we have a major storm or as Tiziana was alluding to, if we had a, a hurricane come through here. We had Isabel, if you remember. That was not really a hurricane for us, but it was a substantial wind um, event. And um, I seem to recall that last November, November a year ago, there was a lot in the papers about 27,000 gallons being dumped in Quanicook Creek. Where did that come from and what was it? That's our watershed, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, I guess it is. You go first. Yeah, you go right. first. I'll go second. Um, so the, the 27 million gallons, that's a number referenced that has to do with pond It heat. was millions. Yeah, 27 and a half million gallons. And that was um, when the pond, before we started moving ash out of the pond, the pond had been sitting there, you know, no ash had gone into it since 2003. So the water on the top, where the ash had settled out under the permit, it would decant, which is basically allow the water to flow off of the top. And so that amount of water was released over, I can't remember the exact timeline, so almost a month timeline. Um, November of last year. Yeah, it was, actually uh, it was actually 16, yeah. It was, it was several years back. Um, but, but the, so then during that time period, we had to do sampling of total suspended solids, things like that, to make sure that the Vermont ash park was coming out. Once it got down, then that structure was sealed and stopped, and then we had pumps pumping it back into the pond to make sure nothing got out from that. So that's what was, it wasn't ash, it was the water from the pond after the ash settled out. Same thing that that pond has done for, you know, the, since I think Pondy is from the And you're saying that that water was completely safe and no yeah, that, that water met all the permit requirements that the state issued That's to protect it. Well, we, we know what we were sampling for at the time, and we know that that, district, that release has happened for many years into that beaver pond, and then we know that we collected samples from that beaver pond, and we're not seeing anything in the beaver pond. So we, you know, that I can tell you, and I can also tell you that we had samples all up and down um, the, uh, you know, the coastline, and compared those to the creek just north that takes similar waters, but nothing from our site, and there's no difference in the metals that are in the water because there's some level of metals in the water regardless. There's no difference between those two creeks. We've also um, actually did um, end up giving money to the state so to help fund their sampling along that same stretch. So there's there's a lot of sampling data that's been done there that shows that there's no impacts to those waters. Those waters are the same as the stream just north of the site. We have a new park down in Stafford, the Whitewater Park, whatever it's called, uh, which is basically a nature reserve for animals. Boy Scouts are going to be camping there and fishing there and so on. And I know from talking with Mr. Morrow, our earlier, uh, earlier event, uh, he had tears.
tears in his eyes when he said that he used to take his Boy Scout troops, he was a Boy Scout leader, uh, to drink water from his well, not knowing that it was actually contaminated. So it's a big thing for individuals here. I live in Montclair, and I consider it my thing too, uh, even though I'm not right in Dumfries. Uh, because I don't know, it seems like so fleeting. I don't know where my, it, it, is my drinking water that comes out of my faucet also contaminated from how possible? I'm not convinced that it isn't. Yes, uh, my name is Alice Crow. I am a retired environmental attorney and I am also a member of the uh, Pencil Young Climate Action Network. Um, I'm very concerned about some of the statements that I've heard made here tonight. If there is leakage, then it's only logical that there's going to be contamination. And my question would be, uh, similar to Tiziana's, who has been testing the water here? Has it been done by a federal or state environmental department? and not someone that may have an interest in the results not showing that there's contamination. That's one of my questions. Okay, we'll answer that one. So, uh, um, so first, um, the state has sampled, I mean, they, they did sample some of the residents wells, I'm sure has been mentioned. Um, Which were found to be contaminated. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. So one found, lead in the well, right? I think I think Department of Health came back and said that that was likely from the pipes. I can also say that all the groundwater data around the ponds, there's no lead. So if there's not lead in the groundwater right next to the pond, how does it get away from the pond? Would you want your children to be drinking that water? Or anyone in your family to be drinking that water? I, that water, the state said, was acceptable to drink. As I recall, they said it did not meet for for the for the lead, right? No, you didn't say it correctly. They said it was not contaminated to private drinking wells because there are no limits to private drinking wells. Because the standards in this country are so damn low. They based it on standards. Standards. the standards. Right. 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 None of it was sampled through any copper pipe or any fittings. It was all plastic pipe. So where did they come from? Yes. So, I'm sorry. I know this was not my turn. Last year, Senator Servo introduced the Senate House bill. Like several of them. One was so simple. He tried to get it so that citizens like us could have our water test results be heard. We know where that went, didn't it? It didn't go anywhere. Last year, Senator Servo had another Senate bill. He wanted to give the DEQ the authority to withhold a permit if they saw flaws in the plan. Didn't everybody already think that the DEQ had the authority to do this? I didn't come here tonight. I'm really sorry that I'm speaking out line. And I'm really, really, I really do not want to come here tonight, another Christmas, and sit here and have to listen to you speak. I'm on Fairness Court right here, because that's my, this gentleman right here, it's the only person who's been representing Prince William County in this whole area. And every single time, you know I was at the 27, 2016, 2017, 2018 legislative session. You know I sat through it. You know that every single time that Dominion has had the floor and we haven't been able to say one word. I'm gonna be real honest, I'm gonna be real fair right now. If it weren't for this man, Jill Calamro over here, Dean, Philip. This issue would have been dead in the water a really long time ago. You know that. You know our drinking wells. Brian West hasn't been able to live in his home in for two years. You're a neighbor of 20 some years. You drive up and down our street every single day. The people worrying about trucks going, I too don't want the trucks. But if I had a choice of trucks or my children's health, Well, hook up to the regular water line and not worry about the wells. It's too late. For 20 some late. years we've been drinking that water and I do have city water. You, and you want to brush over, you want to brush over this incident in Tennessee. Go home, to, go home tonight and look up Jacobs Engineering and the TVA cleanup workers. 
to see how many hundreds of people are sick and have died. This is not a joke. I sat there in the study group. Let's go back. Okay, the first year we got the moratorium, thank you very much. The second year we had a report. We waited a whole year and on December 1st, the report came out on Friday afternoon about four o'clock and it was 800 pages, correct? On Monday morning, Monday morning, so we all had time to read this 900 page report. We showed up in Richmond for the state water board hearing, correct? I thought we might have some luck here because Delegate Torian, Senator Richard Stewart, sit on this board. You were not there. Senator Stewart was not there. And they said it was because, well, excuse me, you didn't. Senator Stewart said because he knew nothing was going to happen. This year, the same thing comes around. If we can't get a simple bill passed, you're not a good neighbor, you're bullies. This is a legacy problem for you, but it's a legacy problem for the Virginia legislator. It's time to stop. Everyone in this room needs to get behind this man, follow this man, and follow the river keepers if you really want to know the truth what's going on back here. And I am sorry, Mrs. Thrall. I am really sorry that yours and my relationship has gotten to this. But I'm fighting for my children. Okay. These are the Department of Health. This is what was in my water. Do you want to see what my report says? I have the report. The lab test. No, you don't have my private test. Because nobody can share them with us. We have danced. Okay. The, the test revealed our drinking wells of hexavalent chromium, arsenic, cobalt, aluminum, barium, yeah. copper, magnesium, Patty, nickel, please. zinc, and Patty, on and on. Patty, let me just say and something. I'm sorry, sorry. Patty, let me just tell you, tell you to address a little bit of what you said, and I mean, you can. You can well, go next I, if you want. But. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear my question answered. Okay, but let me, let, me, let me just talk, let me talk for a second about Patty. So, so those of you who don't know, Patty Morrow and Dan, they live, um, and Brian West, who's sitting right there next to them, they live right next to Pond D. D. E. Pond D. E. Um, and actually, at least I met, I met Patty knocking doors. Uh, and I met Brian and Dan afterwards, but, uh, what Patty was saying is I put in, I think it was five, four bills last year, maybe five, um, and none of them really got heard. We had a hearing. Um, the hearing lasted maybe 10 minutes, maybe five, which is not uncommon in Richmond. Um, the issue got pushed off to the very, very last minute because it was a big issue and we had this other big Dominion bill everybody was focused on having to do with solar power and rate refund and a billion dollars. Our bill got pushed to the end. And the way that the hearing went, there wasn't a lot of time for public input, which happens a lot in Richmond, which it sucks. It shouldn't happen that way. Technically, any one of you can come down and speak on a bill in Richmond, but it didn't happen. And my four or five bills, which you accurately described, pretty much, they all got continued to this committee that's meeting actually next week for the committee to decide what to do. And the bits and pieces that were of that bill, I'm hoping to incorporate bits and pieces into the bill that hopefully the committee will Will support for the whole legislature to consider, but I'm not sure whether the, I'm not sure what, what the committee's going to do. To be honest, and I'm talking to the governor about trying to get the governor to support those things. Okay, and uh, Dominion has not taken a position on any of it. The only position Dominion can take has taken so far is we need this issue to get resolved as soon as possible. This session, we can't kick this down the road again because EPA has an axe hanging over our head. They say it has to be done, it has to get done, or everybody's going to have problems. So. We're going to see resolution in session, one way or the other, and that, that's that's the position they've taken. And, and on the the two bills that passed, they effectively went neutral on them. They didn't oppose the two bills that we actually passed, the moratorium or the study bill. And if they had gone against it, the bills would have had a really rough time. So it's not like they said no, kill it, stop it. They didn't do that. But they know they've got a very expensive problem that needs to get fixed, and and they have been. At least with me, they've had dialogue. But I understand how you all have been personally affected by this. You, and you're, you know, I've seen your well tests, and they're different than what the state's test showed. Um, I think I've seen your test too, Eileen. They're different than what your test showed. Um, no, no, I have. I uh, have my grandfather years. Right, but I think you have a well on your property. I think. But, I do. Yeah, and I think yeah, I saw a test from your well, but um, there's lots of different tests out there. So some of them show really bad things, and some of them show no violation um, and um, I know that the West and the Morroswell show violations or show really nasty stuff that nobody would drink in it so 
Okay. You have one more question you can ask, and we need to keep moving. Uh, yes, I did not get an answer to my previous question, which was, would you want your children drinking the water that you say does not show contamination? That's my question to you. What is your answer? So, um, one of the wells is in the basement, it's 30 a feet yes deep. Or no I would not let them drink out of a well that has mm -hmm. fecal chloroform in it that is is in that well and that's not come from us that's a 30-foot well in somebody's basement but so there is lead and other metals in yeah this there's water. there's lead if it's yes. over the limit i wouldn't want them drinking it but the lead is not coming okay. from the ponds because there's no well all i can say and i and i i understand i'm trying to i understand i'm i'm, I'm frustrating y'all but all i can comment on are the facts and the facts are, and we may have different facts, but the facts that I'm aware of are, one, there's not lead, hexpan chrome, or even arsenic in those wells along that side. All right, around, around D, and then around E, there, there's, there's not lead there. All right, the... Um, you, answer, you answer my question, I have another question. Yeah, I'd like to finish this state, uh, just to clarify what set of facts I'm looking at here. So that's that piece. The county, Prince William County, hired their own consultant to look at the results, look at the results from the wells on site, results from the houses, the geologic conditions, and they said that the water would not move that direction and that the, what was in those wells were not coming from the ponds. That's the county's report, not our report. That's the county's report. So those are the facts that I have and why we say that that is not coming from our ponds. I don't believe those. And that's I respect that. that. That's, that's fine. I do not believe them. I do not think they are environmentally sound conclusions. My second question has to do. Last question. We need to keep moving. Yes, but I need to have right. my questions answered. Right. Okay. Uh, my second question is, I don't think that we got a clear response to Tiziana's question about why taxpayers should have to pay for the pollution that Dominion has created. Dominion is in the business of creating energy, not creating pollution. They have a moral and corporate responsibility to clean up the mess that they make. And as a former environmental attorney, I would like to have a citation to the legal authority that says that Dominion doesn't have to pay for the pollution that they have made. Could someone please give me the legal citation? Uh, Dominion pollutes every day. They have smoke going up their smokestack. And, yes, and they and have permits. For right. air pollution and they have and permits so forth. and they have a DCR permit for their for their dam and they have a water permit for the water monitoring sites and they've got um, air permits for and they have permits for all this stuff and it's all everything they've done has been blessed by the state and by the EPA in terms of how they kept I would stuff. like to know where it says that, that taxpayers have to pay for their pollution that they create. That is my question. I would like to know the legal authority for that assertion. Yeah, I mean, I, all I can tell you is I can I can get back to you. I'll, I'll contact DEQ and tell them to cite me to the Federal Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, and I give you that. You can leave your information with Philip, my aide. Um, we'll email it to you. But that's how it's been explained to me by all the state officials that we have to deal with. Okay. I'll Who's do number? That. Thank uh, you. Patty, you were number nine, and Brian, I think, is next. Yeah, yeah I'm Brian Well, and uh, I appreciate the Tiffany people pulled on my well. That's the first time I've heard of that. Uh, when you discharge that 27 million gallons of toxin all the pond into the feed pond, did y'all install proper dams to hold some of that water back? Install what? Proper dams. Where? Where? On the beaver pond. In the beaver pond? Yeah. Did y'all no. contain some of that 27 million? We did not install anything in the beaver pond. Now there was a, there is a weir right where, now it's no longer, it's all plugged now, but uh, when the pond was in operation, where the pipe came out, there was a weir structure that had sort of a baffle that slowed that down as it came out, but we never constructed anything out in Beaver Pond, never have. So when you discharge that huge volume of water in such a short period of time, I also co-own that pond with the venue, which you're aware of. Why wasn't I consulted and or made aware of that 
because that might be where the big four of them came from because she floods back there from my property and it saturated my septic tank. So, so the flow that's 27 million or 27 and a half million that gets thrown around a lot, um, when all the information we provided on that, all the records, that was consistent with average monthly discharges. No, it's what? been. It, the data is data. Okay. Let's move on look the at the state way. data, look at all the reports over the years. Before every major storm, we used to have discharges like that to lower the level in the pond to make sure it could handle the storm water. You know, that that's the standard. So it was not it was not some abnormal condition compared to how it had operated for many years. Okay. And I know you disagree with that, but that that's right. that's well, the information. So these groundwater monitoring wells that you've installed around the sites mm -hmm. many years ago, was that part of a caveat to your permitting <laughs> that was permitted by the state or required by the state for you to do groundwater monitoring? Yes, so on, on E had wells around it that were required by the water permit. All right, so let me, let me put that there real quick. Can I put uh, that there? No. All right. So why isn't there any data available for 20 years on the two groundwater monitoring wells that are within 100 feet of my well? So what happened that day? Yeah, so the data wasn't collected from those because it wasn't part of our monitoring program. There so what it is is Moderating water was considered important enough no, pond. Not true. So, so the pond had a line of wells right next to it. Two wells were put further out and were monitored once or twice, I believe, to confirm the results of the closer wells. After that, the state had us revert back to monitoring those wells. So those wells were further out of the first line, but there is no data for a period of time because they, they weren't part of the sampling program. But they were added back in. One of them had filled in with sediment. It was replaced so that it could collect the sample and has been in place and been sampled twice or every two weeks for the last two and a half years. Well, so right, right, that was what I was going to answer. I got it previously. Okay. I, I don't know. Let me, Brian, let me just, the footnote I was going to add um, was that the DEQ told me that there were wells between the pond and your property that were not, no longer functional and that they couldn't collect data from, hadn't been collecting data from. I went to DEQ and said, I, I don't understand how they're still in compliance with their permit if they've got monitoring wells that don't work. And DEQ um, went and required them to put in new wells before they gave them the new water permit. Uh, they were going to make it as part of the water permit that never got issued, but DEQ asked them to put it in ahead of time. So now we have a bunch more data that we wouldn't have had if I hadn't leaned on DEQ to make it happen faster. So that's, Scott, I that's, appreciate yeah. it. I appreciate everything you've done. Yeah. If you didn't have a legal obligation to test those wells, you at least had a moral and an ethical responsibility to do it. Well, I, I understand that, and that's why when the concerns were raised, and results from the from from your well and and the other well we discussed earlier um, from the Murrows, we then sampled those wells as Sir Lass, additional wells were put in based on that and those results until we had time to have that data we offered to hook people up to city water sent out notices to those people and we hooked up for those people thus far okay so I am in this mechanical trace what about replacing my water heat? What about all the possible water piping in my house that's completely contaminated with those sediments? What about the heavy metals that are here to all my fixtures? To replace those pipes, you gotta tear out walls, you gotta tear out ceilings, you gotta tear out vanities. Eileen Thrall was actually my realtor when I bought that property. Eileen, was there any bacterial problem with the wells at that point? We didn't test for heavy metals, but you, arranged for a water sample oh, test it was a, it was a sample. for closing. No, you represented me yeah. and we had the water test done and you arranged for it, did we not? And there, was there a problem with the water for bacterial at that time? I don't know. Uh, say, I think, are we off track here? I mean, we're talking about removal of the co-ed. Right, so, where were we? You got, we're number nine, I think. No, we're going to give 10. I'm 10. You're 10. Okay. I'll use 10. There's Bella and 12. But I just want to point out the delegate that Jennifer Carroll Foy is now here. Right here. Uh, so just very briefly, I want to apologize for my tardiness. Um, there was an event 
uh, Supreme Court Justice Ginsburg, and I'm carrying the Equal Rights Amendment, and so that was really pivotal. And there wasn't just one, but two accidents in 95. So somebody should really do something about that. Um, <laughs> but I greatly apologize for my tardiness. Um, I have reviewed the reports and assessments from Dominion. I have personally toured uh, Dominion Ponds along with uh, Delegate Torian, um, and so I'm very much up to date on the information, and I am just really excited to hear a lot of her feedback. And then after we finish, I'll tell you the legislation that I'm going to propose in my stance on cleaning up coal ash. I like that. Okay. Uh, several of us came here tonight. We live on Austin Point Road directly. Uh, on Bonico Creek, and I want with me the records. I'm going to ask a question, but it's in reference to the safety of the residents of Possum Point Road. He and I went out and we counted 199 families that in along the Possum Point Road in order to get to US 1. We only have one way in and one way out. In the case of an emergency, which many of our residents are older, including myself, um, and, it, it, and I have been there 48 years, so we have had trees across the road, we have had um, uh, fire, uh, car wrecks, asphalt trucks, all kinds of things. There is no, no shoulder there, and there is no way to get in or out if you're walk. And so I brought this. This was from a letter that we wrote in 1978, and it says there, um, in 1970, the Prince William County Planning Department stated that State Route 633, Possum Point Road, was carrying more traffic than for which it was designed. It also stated that roads with design capacities that are less than their traffic volumes are inadequate and unsafe. This was in 1978. This report was done in 1967. There weren't that many people on the road at that time. But unless you can guarantee our safety, the, the truck traffic, 105 to 114, you have to double it because they only they come in and they go out. The town of Dumfries is responsible up to uh, Swans Creek. Every Swans Creek comes the rest of us. And I don't think people realize, those of us who are actually front on the road, there's a lot of cold to because that is an unsafe road. It has narrow, and speaking of environmental concerns, if a truck goes over into that creek, that's an environmental concern. Not, not. I mean, what might happen with the, the pond, okay. But along that road, we don't have an active road. There never has been an active road. And we, this, this was 1978. That's 40 years ago when we worked this. And every time something comes up, we have to find it. And it's been ethanol, it's been naphtha, it's been the Mars Gas Company. It's unfortunate that a, a very nice commercial road called Cockpit Point Road was put in there without adequate access. And what we did back in 78 was, we even went and took them in the woods to see where they could put another uh, uh, road through there. And at one time, there was thought that 234 would come across and there'd be a third beltway. Well, that's gone. But, um, you know, please, can you reassure our safety? I mean, I, I've raised my kids on that road, right. so I'm, that's over with, but. I, I remember what I said at the beginning was, at the very end of what I said, was there's a bunch of things that we need to think about adding to the bill to deal with issues like that. And for example, one of the one of the things we could do is put in there that if there's any infrastructure improvements that are necessary in order to accomplish this, that that's also picked up by ratepayers and not something we have to fund, for example, like with the state transportation trust fund gas taxes or something. So that that's something that we could definitely look at and consider. That that wouldn't affect me because I said way off the road on the water. Many of my neighbors are flat on the road. If you were to ride in that road, you would destroy their properties. And but for those the, the Browns and I we can Brown, we kind of and Ray, we right. kind of sit back. So we're all right. right. I remember. We're waterfront property, so people buy that anyway. But I remember I knocked every single door in your street back in 2015, yeah. so I remember it. But the other thing I know is that it's part of Potomac Shores. I know part of Potomac Shores development reaches down pretty close it does. To, to there. And I know they're anticipating to get the development down to there, and I'm not sure exactly Hilda might know. <laughs> or at least 
when Hilda was there, there was actually probably I don't know because the plans probably were more recent than when you were on the board of supervisors. But I know they plan to bring residential development pretty close in there. And I would think there might be eventually yeah. a road that will go through. No? There's a buffer, a pretty good sized buffer, and the idea was it would come across there on 234. But I believe the, the latest uh, comprehensive plan, Hilda might know, uh, precludes. A for a road that would be used industrial. It will come out on the point road, and I want reassurance of our safety. I don't, you know, I drank the water for a long time. I'm not worried yeah. about that. I'm worried well, about our safety. I, I mean, you know, I've heard you loud and clear yeah. between, like I said, we need to look at the road or we can try to mandate rail if our colleagues will pay for it. Like, mandating rail would, would solve that. So. People bike on that road, they walk on that road, and there's no shoulder. I know. I knocked every door on that road and there's you fall in a ditch if you go off the asphalt. Right. I, I remember. Yeah, right. And it's not just, uh, you know, these trucks. There are other trucks and there are buses, school buses. And, yeah. You know, we're, that road is not adequate. Right. They said so 40 years ago. I got you. Who's next? Hey, good evening. Yeah. I'm Brian Morgan and I don't live on Possum Point, but I live in the adjacent cul-de-sac which backs up to Possum Point. So it's kind of one of one of those, I live off of Dewey's Run, so our street yes. backs in right to it. So my question pretty much is what, uh, what Eileen had, and essentially looking at as part of the contract that was led or the RFP that was put out, was there not an environmental or not an impact statement? that was attached to that particular RFP, which would have given some kind of indication that there was going to be increased traffic, not only on Possum Point, but also the load that was going to take place on Route 1. So with that, just thinking about that, again, using utilizing a number of 115 trucks, you throw that out, and we did not hear any concept of operation times, I imagine running 115 trucks, that's 24 hour operation. Eight, hour, eight hours. So we're looking at an eight hour time frame. That's, so, that's my question I got answered, it's eight hours. Okay, so that's, that's, why, I, that's why I said one every four minutes, or if you're going both ways, one every two minutes. Right, so that, that's an eight hour time frame, so now we're not, now we're not messing with, with uh, rush hour in the morning or in the afternoon. So in, in that sense, when you're trying to mix those trucks in with that morning rush or afternoon rush, now we just got to do it. We have, we have a big mess. Right. And there's no way to deal with that. So the other thing that I have is, you know, we've talked a lot about this information about testing, but and the and the testing that has been done on the water for the folks that are on Possum Point. What I have not seen, or what I have not been able to lay my hands on, I'll put it that way. Maybe I just didn't come across the right website. I'll take I'll take the benefit of that. But for the residents that live in the adjacent housing area in Swans Creek and in the areas that back up behind the coal ash where all this is leaking leaching into the groundwater. Is that area being tested also? I mean we know we know the area in Possum Possum Creek, Possum Point being tested, but the outside out right. outside of the area, are any of those areas being tested? So what is the what is the boundary? I get I get right next to the to the pond. I got that. I got that. I understand that. So what's what what's what's the range? So so as far as sampling goes, um, when when you're when you're looking at pond delta, as uh, the riverkeeper quoted earlier in the report, groundwater flows towards Quantico Creek. So it it goes towards Quantico Creek, not backwards towards the area I believe you're referencing. Right. Swans Creek. So, so but there but there are Cheerio wells Rose. that that. One of the things the regulations requires is what are called upgrading wells. So right. you have to have wells that are supposed to be representative of what the natural groundwater is like before it gets to your pond, landfill, whatever it is. So those are monitored and and show you know only what's there naturally. Um, but then all the other groundwater from that point moves towards Quantico Creek. Okay. So help me understand where they're changing the topography of everything behind Cherry Hill, where they've gone in. They've taken out the whole top of the hill, the mountain. I agree with you, water runs downhill. 
But when you take out the whole mountain, now we have a change in topography. So from that standpoint, you haven't got the same water flow. And when you've changed it, because they're bringing in the VRE and they're putting all that other stuff that happened on that uh, on the spur. So they're bringing in all those other things. So I understand, I, I get that. But those surrounding areas, that, in my mind, that has to be, those are those are such things also. So, so one thing that they do is, um, in addition to sampling all the groundwater wells, upgrading it under it, they also require that you take a, a, a water elevation measurement. So basically, you survey in the top of the well, and then you measure how far down to the water. Okay. And so using that information, we have to create a map that shows, um, think of like a contour map that shows what shape the hill is. It's the exact same thing, but for groundwater. So we have to do that every time that we sample that semi-annual we have to check those levels and then the annual report we have to generate a map that shows this is the groundwater conditions as far as what direction is flowing all those things and so what we've seen thus far is that that still continues to go towards quantico creek and, and i do agree that they have changed a lot of the elevations there i did you're talking about the potomac shores construction yeah. yeah they have changed a lot but the groundwater is 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 deeper than that and our the well elevations haven't changed yet, okay. so uh, that that's that's what is up now, right? Um, but but typically it takes something pretty extreme to, to shift groundwater when there's that much of a gradient. It's different when you're in like the coastal area of Virginia where the groundwater is more flat, um, you know, like down near the beach. But here in this particular area, we've got terrain right there by the coastline that that really has that flow going towards the creek. And we have six minutes before the school kicks us out. So we have two more two more questions and then we'll be done. Jennifer and Jennifer wants to speak. Gentleman in the back and then we had gentleman here. Then Delegate the Carol Ford. When I was school said, I've been living in Dumfries for 20 years. And it looks to me that you did your homework. You stay the area, you're supporting your company. It's fine. You gotta destroy the road with your project, right? You expect the taxpayer to pay for that project. Am I right? Am I correct? Well, okay. I think Look, what we said is, is that's to be determined depending yeah, on what happens. It's a business, right? Closure. You manage a business, right? Am I right? I mean, we, we. Okay, no, no. You manage a business, which is Dominion Virginia Power, right? Dominion Power. I don't. I'm okay, but you work for them, sure. right? Yeah. You charge for the electricity, right? We don't get it for free, yeah. right? Okay, if I go to a restaurant and buy food and I got leftovers, the restaurant take care of that, right? Why we need to take care of your uh, leftovers? So, so no, no, my, that's for you. Senator, yeah, that, Why? answer, but as, as the Senator said, I think if there is a scenario where there was truck traffic, you would look for some sort of assurance on yeah. protecting the road. Now, okay. I will say- Okay, I he's will, gonna look for that answer. Let but me, let it's your company, let, right? Let me answer so the question. We pay his salary, so that means that you're going to pay for that too. So it doesn't matter how you get paid. To doing business, doing this is a business. So we, we you manage other, a business, we right? We've had other projects where, if there's well, in, don't talk about the other projects. That we do well, answer that. for this answer project. Your question, then, sir. Yeah. And you need to answer for this project. We don't care about the other project. I know, but this you is know, a project that has not happened. This is a project that there still needs to be the decision okay. on what's but done. But why do you but expect it, the taxpayers to pay sir. for this? You manage a business. Uh, we don't get the electricity for free. I'll, I'll, Am I right? Let me answer. Sir, let, let him try and answer, okay? Okay, try we don't get the electricity for free. Agreed, okay. nor do I. I pay for it as well. Okay, now, next question. How many of you guys of your company live near the plant? None of you, right? Am I right? Yes. None of you, yeah, these right? Who lives near the these people live there. Yeah, they do. I do not. People at the station live nearby. Yeah. I handle I handle environmental for for a number of states. I'm based in Richmond, but our folks, the city. Are you near people, a plant? The 60 people that work at the station, they live in this area. And the area? They live in this area. Any of them are area. your neighbors? Any of them are your neighbors? No, right? 
I do, sir. I live very close. I can walk to Boston Point of Palms. Um, walk? Palms. Do you live near the, the plant? I do. I do live near. Yes, sir. I sure live so near. you support them? I never said that. You asked who lives near, so I was just answering. So you don't agree with them, then? I will speak right after you finish. And I'll tell you it, exactly to me, This is ridiculous to me. You make a ton of money every year. And you don't spend any money to fix your problem. Because this is your problem. This is not our problem. You make money from us. Because we pay for the electricity. And you still want us to pay for your trash? I want to call that trash. Okay. They charge you to, to clean. I mean, they charge you for the energy, and then they're going to be charged to clean. Exactly. It's like double dipping. See, we still are. I'm, I'm think, sorry about this. We still are slaves. The slaves of your company and the slaves of. Yes, we are. Because we're paying you for the electricity. And we're going to pay you again to clean up your mess. Sir, I think we got your, your point. We have three minutes left. We have one more question, and then Jennifer wants, or Dolly Carroll wants to speak, so we need to keep moving. But I think we, I think you made your point. Yeah, that's why I work for the union. Because <laughs> I'm not a slave. I try to make more money, like you guys. By the other hand, I give back to the community. Okay. Thank you. Phil. All right, I'm Phil Agency, just with the Potomac River Keeper. I'm sorry, please clarify a couple of points and then I have a question for today and I'll be very short. Um, we were talking earlier, and Senator Surabell, you said you thought that there had been no violations of groundwater standards. Okay, it's a site there have at, been. At Boston Point, yes. there have been no violations issued. Uh, that's actually incorrect. So I'm looking on my phone at a November 13th, 2018 report from Dominion to the state talking about exceedances of groundwater protection standards for cobalt and lithium. So they have this reported exceedances at Boston Point from their monitoring wells. It's I just finish the, I just didn't hear what year. It's this year, November. This report is from November of 2018. Okay. So they have so the exceedances and then it's That's fine. Okay. You've had your whole evening. Um, so there have been exceedances of these particular metals, cobalt and lithium. Those are harmful to human health. Just like awesome. all these other metals at Fossil Point. Um, we know that these metals move through the groundwater at different speeds. So just because lead hasn't shown up in certain areas or ar arsenic hasn't shown up in certain areas doesn't mean they will not show up later when the metals move through the groundwater very slowly. Another point I very quickly want to make is that we talked about the pond clean liner. You mentioned that it has a partial clay liner. Dominion reported to EPA under EPA's requirements for the federal national rules on coal ash disposal, they admitted that this pond does not meet EPA requirements for having a liner. So this is essentially an unlined pond. We have plenty of data to show that it leaks into the environment. Um, I also just want to mention, I don't want to get into a debate, just want to mention the 27 million gallons of coal ash water. I don't think anyone disagrees that Dominion discharged 27 and a half million gallons of untreated water from the coal ash pond into Quantico Creek and into the Potomac River without any treatment at all. So I'll just leave it there. Thank you. I'm sorry, my question for Dominion. Um, now that we have all this information about the condition of Pond D, we have legislation or legislators that want to make a permanent solution to this. Is Dominion ready to take cabin place off the table and make sure that they support these solutions that we're talking about? So no, not at this time. Um, and that's because we still need to make the decision at each site. There's a few things I want to clarify because I feel like it's misleading the folks here. One is there were no exceedance of health base limits like you said. That same document that you're referencing has zeros or dashes under the federal CCR. Under the state, which I did mention, the state has a standard of background. If it's below, if it's, if it's higher below than it is in the background, then that's considered an exceedance, and that's going to trigger that you have to do something. That's not the same as over a health limit. So those I, are two I different say things. Over health limit. I say okay. We're talking about the general environment. You talked about that they were hazard to health, but they're not at those concentrations. The metals at certain levels are. And these were reported at five times the groundwater protection standard. The, based on the background, not on the drinking water standard. They're all below what that standard is based on health-based risk that the federal government puts out. And that's right very clearly in that same letter yes, that anybody yes. can go to dominionenergy.com slash coal ash and you can see all the information on the sites. You can download this report we've talked about tonight for yourself. You can also 
look at the prior 1398 report, and there's a link that'll take you to postings like he's referencing. And then lastly, I think there was a lot of stuff in that, but um, the liner, um, you know, again, to say it's, it doesn't meet the new federal requirement. The new federal requirement is two feet of clay with that synthetic liner, all right? That's what they require now. It's the same thing they did in 1993 when they started requiring that for sanitary landfills that didn't have liners. So it's a big difference between saying there's no liner there and saying the liner doesn't meet the two feet of clay plus the membrane. It doesn't, we've never argued that. We've said on the side slopes, there's a foot of clay. At the bottom is natural clay that's multiple feet thick, but that doesn't meet what the rule that came out in 2015 requires, which is two feet of clay and a membrane. Nobody's ever debated that. It doesn't change the fact that there's a foot of clay there. Dominion has and then, repeatedly asserted that this pond, if they have a pond, clay will not be. That, and, and that's fair. And the other thing to remember that I didn't touch on earlier is with this pond, and I'm not saying capping places the way to go, I'm not saying dig it up, any of that, just stating the options. We have to continue monitoring the groundwater for a minimum of 30 years after it was closed, if it were closed in place, a minimum. At the end of 30 years, you don't get to just stop. You would have to petition the state, show that there's no concentrations left, everything's back to normal, and you would be released from it potentially at that point. That's 30 years. If at any time along that step, you trigger any sort of corrective action, you still have to do it. And because of the state requirement on comparing the difference to what's upstream versus downstream in the groundwater, that's gonna be required. So even if this is closed in place, there's gonna have to be a groundwater remediation, something there to address that. But don't if not, state, don't need the state enforces that requirement. Well, they don't have a choice, it's in the rule. I don't think I Senator Sorbel or Delegate Torm would, would let that slide. So I, right. Jennifer's gonna tell you what she wants, the bill she's gonna carry. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And then uh, we're gonna wrap it up. <laughs> we gotta get out of here, the school kick us up. All right. So uh, I want to thank all of you for being here um, and seeing all of your faces, asking questions and sharing your concerns. So someone asked if any of the legislators live near the coal ash ponds, and they do, and that is me. It is in my district, it affects my constituents, and it's something I'm very passionate about. So I was one of the people who I'm very adamant about how we do this. So knowing the information that we know now and seeing what has been published, I read the reports and the assessment. One of the things that I feel is a shortfall is that there was not a hybrid approaches that were really analyzed. It's actually do this and this is the timeline and this is the inflated price. I think one of the biggest takeaways is that you cannot treat Chesterfield like Possum Point, like Chesapeake. They're all individual. They're not one size fit all. So what my proposal is, the legislation that I will be bringing forth is to recycle and reuse into cinder blocks, cement, whatever have you, as much as we possibly can, for there to be clean closure of the rest of it, which means that it's excavated and removed to an off-site landfill away from waterways that meets current EPA standards with the membrane and the layer and everything else, and that it's away from our communities where it can have irreparable harm to our children, to our drinking water, to our waterways. We have to protect our rivers. That's what I want to see happen. Now, I understand that in some locations, that's not a possibility to recycle most, if any, of it. Well, those are conversations that we'll have, and we can look at each individual location and clean close them responsibly. And so that is the legislation that I look forward to bringing. I hear all of your concerns about truck traffic. Now, here's how I feel about truck traffic. There is a rail that's there, and we can actually rail out a lot, and then you don't have to do with the, the residual. Those are possibilities. And I understand that truck traffic is an inconvenience, but you know what else is? Cancer. Right? Yeah. Right? Having things that really severely harm your health and that you can't do anything about. Now, I've read the reports and I understand everyone's talking points, but we have to do what's responsible for our community and our children. We get one time at this. One. And that's it. So we have to do what's right. Not what's easy. Not what's cheap. We have to put people before profits and we have to do what's responsible and right for our community and our environment. Woo. That is what I say to for any questions that you want to talk after the event. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming out tonight. We appreciate you all coming out and giving us your input and your questions. Please.